Alrighty, prepare to be inspired. My guest is Cynthia Monteleone. She is a world champion in the 400 meter and she is 49 years old and we are going to get all into that. And if you're not watching on YouTube, just imagine like goddess level, level gorgeous model. And you're like, how are you 49? Are you sure? <laughs> She's a mom of three, an author of uh, an author and a metabolic analytics practitioner. So um, metabolic analytics was one of the certifications that I did um, from Charles Polican before he passed and Cynthia like really mentored under him. So she's really deep in that. And so she has so much amazing information and just in her own research and studies since then. So she's just a powerhouse of information. So we're going to get into a lot of cool stuff today. Um, but yeah, she, the, Cynthia was introduced to me through Brad Kearns, who's been a guest and is actually coming on again soon. Um, and I was just like, wow, you're so amazing <laughs> because she's um, gotten into, she ran track in college, but she's gotten into it again in her forties. And she's, you know, winning these world championships and learning how to hurdle and pole vault and do discus like within the last year, like just, you know what I mean? It's so cool. So I'm going to let her get into all that. And she also works with a lot of athletes from Olympians to college athletes, high school, um, and she has some really interesting food for thought in regards to sprinting versus endurance running. Um, so she's got a list of research back benefits that I think you will find really interesting. And she does encourage it for people over 40. And I feel the same way. Um, I mean, to each their own, everybody, you know, can do their own thing, but at least for I'm 41 uh, right now and I find sprinting to feel a lot more in alignment for me and my health than um, endurance running like I used to do forever so yeah we're aligned there she's just actually doing it competitively and I'm just doing it on the turf at the gym <laughs> um, her website is mam808.org um, and we will also link up her books in the show notes all right so let's go ahead and get into it here is Cynthia Mon Monte Leon. Okay, so Cynthia, I feel silly interviewing you on Zoom. I should have just driven over to your house because <laughs> Cynthia lives on the big island now. And, you know, really so sorry that you live here in some ways because I know that you were over in Maui before and, you know, had to move over here. So, um, but hopefully you're enjoying the big island. And I was grateful because our mutual friend Brad Kearns introduced us and I'm like, you live here? Whoa. <laughs> so we got to work out together the other day and go have some breakfast. And so it's been fun. Yeah. And I'm I'm so excited to introduce you to the audience because, you know, there's a quote from Leo Tolstoy that I love that I'm sure will re resonate with you. And it's everyone thinks of changing the world. No one thinks of changing himself, right? Or herself. And it's like, really, if you want to make moves, like be it, be it, be it, be it. If you want to inspire people, be inspiring. If you want to show people that something can be done, do it, right. you know, and, and that's your, your, own way, your own journey. Yeah. Because we're all so different. Yeah. Okay. So let's, let's get straight into the kind of exciting okay. stuff. Will you tell them what you're up to with running and, and track and field and like yeah. where maybe start yeah. back the fact that you ran before and now you're mm -hmm. re-entering that? Sure. Yeah. I'm so, I'm just really grateful that I get to share my story with your audience and hopefully, you know, my mission is to help others thrive. So I hope that this interview will help someone um, have some inspiration to be their superhero optimal self, because that's what I'm all about is and helping others and inspiring others to be their superhero optimal self. So um, like I said, we can each do that in our own way, but there are consistent patterns to those who are successful. And so my story is that I'm I'm actually almost 49. It's less than 18 months until I'm 50, which is yes, very you exciting. have to get on YouTube if you're not on YouTube. It's like what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I began my journey running at age 40. I did run in high school, and I was recruited to a Division One program in North Carolina. Um, but then, you know, I graduated, and I thought, okay, I'm done. That's it. I'm not going to the Olympics or anything like that. So. I did not run at all for 20 years, okay? Like nothing, I didn't run 5Ks, nothing. And so um, at age 40, I decided, okay, I just finished breastfeeding my third child. And I always tell women out there, hey, like don't be in a rush to lose your body fat because actually those toxins can come out in your breast milk and that sort of thing. So just like, there's a reason you're holding on to that extra fluff. So don't be in a rush. Um, but I, it was time I had was done breastfeeding 
Um, and I was like, okay, I'm looking for a challenge. And my daughter said to me, mom, I want to run track in college like you did. She was 11. And so I said, okay, well, let's go do a 400 and see where we're at. Well, <laughs> that was the hardest 400 of my life. <laughs> uh, we crawled across the finish line in something like a minute and 30 seconds, which is not particularly fast. Um, and uh, that's where we started our journey. So we started training together. And I told, um, uh, I basically decided I wanted to be a world champion. And so um, I started learning metabolics through my mentor, Charles Polican. in, um, gosh, I started following Charles's work way earlier than I actually met him. But so probably about 12 years, 13 years now that I followed his work, but I became a metabolic practitioner um, under him and uh, basically learned all the tips and tricks to you know, getting to the most optimal version of myself. Um, and then he, he taught me a really incredible skill, which is to do my own research. So above and beyond, I am reading, you know, 50 medical journal articles a week. I read a couple of books a week. Um, sometimes I take weeks off, so not consistently every week, but generally that's what I'm reading uh, to get my answers because I can't really trust all of the headlines out there which I'm sure you realize too. Um, so yeah, so I started my journey at age 40. And by age 43, not only did I become a world champion in the 400 meters, however, I run faster than I did in college as a division one athlete. So it's my inspiration to share with others, not just my journey, but all of the tips and tricks of how I did it. What were the, the ways that I found were successful, not just for me, but for my clients. So I have, I've had thousands and thousands of metabolic clients, but I also work with Olympians, professional athletes in many different sports, surfing, sailing, jujitsu, not just running. But I do have the top in the world track athletes in master's age groups. I have Sue McDonald is a very good client of mine. She follows everything I say very to the T, um, which athletes is are so awesome that indic way. <laughs> indicative of her personality, you know, uh -huh. as a champion. She broke 11 world records last year at age 61. She ran 61 seconds in her 400 meters, which is crazy. Like fastest wow. in history, fastest in the world. Wow. I mean, it's hard for anyone, male or female at any age to run close wow. to 60 seconds in a 400. Yeah. Uh, wow. Christina Trucks, age 40. She just broke the American record in the 400 as well. My client, um, she, is, she ran a 56 second 400. Wow. Um, and then Emma McGowan, she's 56. Uh, she runs a 13, low 13 second or high 12, 100 meters. And she runs a low 26 second, 200 meters. And she also runs around 60 seconds for her 400. So just uh, wow. sampling, for instance. Yeah. So what I'm saying is it's not just me. I like to share, you know, my knowledge with others. And, and I, my real passion is, and I'm happy to share with your audience, my top 10 reasons why sprinting is beneficial for you. <laughs> when you're aging, as opposed to training for a marathon, because uh -huh. I feel like women turn, especially women, but men too, sometimes they turn 40. And instead of thinking, Oh, I want to train for the hundred or for, like me, I want to train yeah. for sprinting for the 400. They think oh, I'm going to train for a marathon. And right. I really feel like it's a bad road to go down. It's girl. This has yeah, been a thing for me. Yeah. Forever. Because availability, because on every city and every, you know, constantly year round, there's all these marathons, half marathons, 5k, 10k, you know, maybe a 10 miler. There aren't, I'm like, can you start this? There aren't, it's not as accessible to do track, but it would be so much more. I totally agree with you. It'd be so much more beneficial. It's just, there aren't really like random adult public track events available. And I'm like, this is are. about to shift. There are. Okay. It's so just, tell me, tell me more. Cause you've obviously, know. yeah, yeah. they How don't do know. And it's this? my, also my passion to share this with others. Yeah. Um, there's a, there's a USA track and field, usatf.org uh -huh. um, has a master's program and it's usatfmasters.org. Mm. Um, and you, as long as you're age 35 or older, you actually, you don't even have to be 35. You can be 25 and still go to the U S uh, national master's track championship at okay. age 25. Um, the actual world categories start at age 35 and it goes in five, uh, year age groups and you compete against people your age. Okay. So 30 to 39, 40 to 44, that kind of thing. And, um, it's everywhere. They have okay. associations, Yay. clubs everywhere. We have them here in Hawaii. We just don't have any on the big island that I know of right now. I okay. think I, I'm still making contacts. We had a, I had a track club on Maui. So every Sunday we would get together and do a track workout. 
I would give track workouts. On Oahu, they have a few different clubs. Um, Spartan Track Club is my favorite. And they actually have, if you want to go, Tara, they have a meet uh, the day after Thanksgiving. They have a meet, I think, around Halloween. Okay. Like, I do want to go. Yeah, I do want to so, go. I'm not for, like a skilled sprinter, but I'll run as fast as I freaking can. Yeah, because it's fun. <laughs> like, sprinting right. is fun. Marathon <laughs> running, running for long distances. I mean, it, it's probably, it's meditative, you know, but it's yeah. not as fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, so we do have, okay. we do have um, master's associations all over. And on the mainland, it's a lot easier because you can get in your car and drive to a track meet. And they have them pretty regularly starting in December indoor. And okay. then uh, moving to outdoor. And if you want to run for Team USA, like I do, I represent Team USA, you don't even have to have a qualifying time. You really? can go to Florida, which it's not been in uh, the USA for decades. You go to Gainesville, Florida in March and join me in running for Team USA wow. if you're 35 or older. And wow. I have sprint programs um, that I wrote just in case anybody wants to train for them on my website. But what I'm saying is, you don't, there's no qualifying time. You register. You pay, I think it's like 130 bucks, maybe. They they send you a Nike official USA uniform. No way. And rep- yes. And you represent <laughs> Team USA. And I'm trying to get more women to sign up, especially because wow. the head of USATF Masters said only uh, it's like 70% men and only what? 30% women for America. Yes. And it's oh usually in Europe, but it's in Gainesville, Florida in March. So please join me, y'all. And come sprint okay. 60 meters, 200 meters, 400 meters, 800 meters. I mean, they have all the events. And field so, events too, right? Field events too. If you don't like to run, how about throwing a shot put? You yeah, because you were telling me you started doing it. some of these field events. You're like, I've never yeah. done this stuff in my life. Yeah, it's like <laughs> field day at school all over again. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, hey. I just I started learning the um the decathlon because uh I'm a really big advocate for standing up for women and women in sports and fairness in women's sports. And um, that also means, you know, having the same opportunities basically as men. And we have been doing the heptathlon as women for all these years. And the men do the decathlon because it was previously thought that women weren't strong enough to pole vault. So obviously we know that that's not true now that women can pole vault. And so um, the masters have opened up and pioneered uh, the women's decathlon. And we had our first elite event this year as well at the end of the summer. But um, I was able to compete in the master's decathlon for women and I'm number one in the world. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. and, uh, probably because nobody else in the world is doing it yet. But hey, <laughs> uh, but wow, yeah, I won, that's so I won cool though. Group, and it was it was a really hard event, but it was really a lot of fun to learn these new things. Discus yeah. I've never done before hurdles. Um, you know, pole vault's new to me this year. So wow. it's just a lot of fun. So I really just, I encourage learning new things as you age and track is kind of the perfect thing because you can choose all from all these different events. Yeah. Wow. I mean, that makes sense. Cause I, my uncle, like I was telling you, my mom's brother, he's still, I think he's gotta be in his late sixties and he's still competitively pole vault. So that must be what he's linked up with. And I had no idea. Oh my gosh. I'm like, my, my mind is going to like yes. some, some comedian guy, just like signing up. He's like, I'm going to the world championships in Tampa, yes. Florida. He's got his track. So that's what I would, that's what I'm going to feel like, but no, that's cool. I really want to do that with you. I think that sounds so fun. And I had no yeah. idea it was so accessible like that. It is and very accessible. Mm-hmm. That is amazing that you're helping that get on the, you know, to change that. It's like, gosh, you know, you think it's like we hear, oh, women couldn't even start a business until what, like the nineties or it was some kind of crazy recent thing. And we still have stuff like this going on. And real quick, what is the difference between the decathlon and the heptathlon? Sure, the heptathlon is seven events and the decathlon is 10 events. So they're both two day, uh, two day events. So you do the heptathlon, you do four on day one and three on day two, but the decathlon, you do five and five. So it's a hammer. But okay. I mean, 90 year old Flo Myler was right next to me. Wow. Breaking world record after world record. And oh, she fun. Was so much fun. Oh my gosh. She did a decathlon. So if 90 year old Flo Myler can do a decathlon, any any other woman can also do a decathlon. Oh my so God. That I, I did so have fun. the um, pleasure of um, helping the uh, elite champion. Um, her name is Allison Halverson. Uh, she basically um, studied all of my 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 work and implemented practices, and then she called me the day of the decathlon for help with like her nutrition and her energy because she wasn't 
quite as prepared as she thought. And so I actually helped her that day. She found me on Instagram. I just happened to be, ha she didn't have my phone number or anything. She just follows all of my podcasts and that stuff. That's how she learned. But she, <laughs> after having my coffee, my, it's like someone's calling you on Instagram. I'm all, what? And it was Allison. And she's like, can you please help me? Like, I need some That's energy. That's so awesome. Stuff. Yeah. So I was, I just feel really just blessed to be able to have helped her, um, you know, to win the elite decathlon and wow. world championship. So, so cool. Yeah. Okay, I gotta back up as a because you know, I, I want to talk about your. Team. Have, I'm gonna have to come to you. We're gonna have to have a part two of this. I can already tell because yeah, it's not <laughs> for us to talk about <laughs> after after our championship. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So a few things. One, as a mindset coach, I just have to highlight that you said I decided I was going to be a world champion. I decided. That is so powerful. That is so everything. It's like once that decision is there and you're already the kind of person that's going to follow through with that. Like when I hear I decided it's I'm in full belief, like that is what's happening. Right. Yes, and that exactly. is so powerful. Um, and then you've been able to help others also do this. So let's kind of get into, you said there are like 10 things, right? Well, I think, you know, I just wanted to touch on that for a second because something mm -hmm. we talked about in person when we trained together was that um, a lot of times people I think are just floating and not deciding and they don't know what they want. And right. I think it's really important to like, you know, spend some time with yourself. Um, I tell my clients, you know, take a few minutes every morning and kind of meditate, write down your goals for the day. This is something I learned from Charles, write down your goals for the day that haven't happened yet. Maybe three things that you want to happen, but just act like they already happened. Like it yeah. could be small or big. It could be uh, you know, I had a successful day at work today. You know, I was able to help a couple of clients, like whatever it is, just write it down or you can just recite it in your head. So I think empowering yourself to make a decision and towards the direction, whether it's a romantic relationship that you want, the type of partner you are looking for, the type of goal that you want, like just really identify like what would benefit me to being my superhero optimal self, you know, like yeah. for me sticking to uh, something that's going to increase my longevity and health benefits was having the 400 meter, you know, world championship as my goal. Uh, right. My husband, you know, I, I definitely just decided this is what I want. And he kind of just like, I felt like showed up at my door. Um, so I just want to say the mindset is very powerful yeah. that way. You're right. And you just have to really make a decision. Like, and so yeah. I think a lot of people are just floating through, like, I'm not really sure. Like, right. or they don't pinpoint what they want. So yeah. yeah part of it but yeah. yeah okay so running wise what go ahead questions? yeah you said what did you say you have 10 things for what oh what was this this might take a while but I could try to consolidate it really quick I like to talk about 10 reasons why sprinting is more beneficial yes over 40 especially but really yeah. at any age than um marathon or endurance training do you want me yeah. to hear that? yeah I want to hear them because okay. I, I think this is needed, needed. Okay. <laughs> and this is again, backed up with many, many hours of researching medical journals. And I just recently revisited some of the, um, because I, I really wrote this less like 2021, it's been a while, but I've researched all of this, the topics again, and there's, you know, even more research that backs this up. Okay. So the first one is hormone balance. Mm -hmm. Um, after age 40, especially, uh, well, actually really after your 20s, your hormones start uh, declining. And mm -hmm. so especially we want to keep testosterone up for athletic performance and longevity and holding muscle mass and things like that. So we know muscle is, that's, we're going to get to that, but muscle is, you know, the organ of longevity. Dr. Gabrielle mm -hmm. likes to say that. Um, but yeah, so uh, hormone balance, endurance training plummets testosterone, plummets it. If you look at the data from endurance trained athletes, they have really, really low testosterone, especially. And then that can actually throw all the other hormones out of balance as well. Um, you tend to have estrogen dominance in the endurance trained athletes in women. Yeah. And so really your hormones are more balanced and you have a better, uh, you know, better menstrual cycles for women, higher testosterone for men in sprinting as opposed to endurance training, well backed up in the research. Yeah. Um, number two is gastrointestinal problems. <laughs> if you look up endurance gastrointestinal in PubMed, 
you're going to find more than you want to read. So or just run a marathon and you don't need to read any of that. <laughs> yes. So, um, the American Journal of um, Exercise uh, Science I came out with a study that linked, it was basically a, um, it was a collective study of all the other studies that link that microbacteria in our gut to the type of exercise we do. And it turns out the type of exercise we do can dictate what microbacteria are in our gut. And if you don't know, our microbiome is like about three pounds of us. It, it fills about a half of a gallon jug and it has more DNA than we do. So sometimes I think we're kind of like puppets of this yeah. microbacteria, right. I don't even know, but they are really in control. If, if you, <laughs> It's, it's totally. a fascinating subject and it's one that we totally. barely tap. It's like stars in the universe. Right. We've right. barely tapped it. Yep. And so uh, what we recently found out though, is that if you do resistance training and drink whey protein, for instance, you're going to actually have a better microbacteria balance than if you do endurance training and eat plant-based. So there are a lot of different avenues Crazy. with this subject, but endurance trained athletes had an overabundance of a bacteria called Prevotella which is actually uh, shown to be also overabundant in vegetable eaters, mostly vegetarians, vegans, mm -hmm. because it's um, it produces too much of this Prevotella copri, it's called, and that overabundance leads to things like rheumatoid arthritis and MS and also other autoimmune disorders. Um, these bacteria escape and settle into inflamed tissues and joints. Long story on that one. We can go into that another day because it's mm -hmm. like a, you know, deep mm -hmm. dive. But basically, mm -hmm. I can identify all my well. My mentor Charles would say, all non-traumatic joint pain is actually bacteria. Um, so you really want to take care of your microbacteria. Totally. And sprinting has been shown, like resistance training, to be more beneficial, have a more beneficial profile in microbacteria. So that's number two. Um, number three. Sprinting makes you smarter than endurance training. They yeah. actually studied this. They studied sprinting and the effects on the brain as opposed to endurance training. So sprinting increases something called BDNF more than endurance training. Yeah. BDNF is brain-derived neurotropic factor. And it's like a protein that fertilizes your brain. Have you talked about this before in your podcast? No, I'm just aware. Yeah. I'm, okay. I'm, a, I'm a, my mom had Alzheimer's, so I'm pretty BDNF um, obsessed. I'm like anything yes, that increases okay. BDNF is like, bring it. <laughs> yeah. So they found the higher intensity work, especially yeah. with sprinting, um, as opposed to the long, slow distance or endurance training that increases the BDNF more, which actually, you know, does more than just make you smarter. Well, that's going to be the next one. It makes you happier. But um, it does make you smarter. They, they measured learning ability after sprinting as opposed to after endurance training. It was fascinating studies yeah. that they did. And well, yeah, and learning being, ability was more after sprinting. And just kind of positioning learning ability as also meaning the ability to change your life, the be ability to change your patterns. That's why I'm kind of after that with my clients too, is, you know, we want some of that high intensity work. We want to hit those limits. We, you know, I like doing things like, intermittent fasting for the right person, not everybody, especially women over 40, probably not, but sometimes, um, and you know, cold showers and it just, it, you know, so it's, it, yeah, you're able to learn, but you're also able to like increase the quality of your life much more easily. The more BDNF, uh, BDNF yes. you have. That's true. Exactly. More neuroplasticity. Yeah. All right. So you're making more connections. Um, yep. so yeah, because of that BDNF increase, it actually makes you happier too. So there's, if you, Again, go to PubMed, type in sprinting, anxiety, or sprinting depression. You're going to find a multitude of studies where they've measured the effects of sprinting on happiness. And it turns out that it increases happiness by decreasing anxiety and depression more so than endurance training. So that's pretty exciting too. Yeah. Um, and then number five, overuse injuries. Okay. So a lot of people will say, oh, I can't start sprinting because I'll just pull a hamstring. Well, yeah, I'm not saying go out there and go max right. effort, <laughs> right. uh, but uh, there's a way to start. And we can talk about that after this list. Right. But, um, if you are endurance training or training for a marathon, specifically marathon, this research has shown that there are more overuse injuries. And this is because of the repetitive motion 
without the strength. So like I talked to my physical therapist about this, who's a genius. And he was saying that it's very rare that marathon runners actually take the time to strength train. And the strength training is very important for all runners, all types of runners. Um, so I would say that that's part of it. But if you look at tendons, again, do a search tendons and marathon runners, you're going to find that actually the tendon structure changes from endurance training and it breaks down, the tissue breaks down. So you, not only that, they tend to have too long of exercise and not long enough of recovery because they're always having to get right. into miles right. uh, or, you know, the Ks, if you're from a European or Australian country, you <laughs> want to get the Ks, <laughs> uh, kilometers, but yeah, so they're getting too much work in that's not really producing the same amounts of benefits and yeah. overusing and wearing down the tendons mm -hmm. and muscles. So mm -hmm. overuse injuries uh, would be number five. I'll um, say but, real quick on that yeah, one. Just, that's the main reason I can't bring myself to marathon anymore. Like that one right there. Cause I, I used to forever. I used to do this endurance mm -hmm. thing forever. And I was always getting injured. It's just, it's just so much time out there pounding, you know, and I've, I've been sprinting. I mean, not like you, but like sprinting for fun at the gym yeah. since then, probably the last, I don't know how long has it been five, somewhere in five to nine years. I don't know how six to eight years or something. And it's just one, it's more fun. And two, I, I'd not run it. If, if you sprint and something feels off, you just stop. Well, if you got a marathon to train for and you're on mile 12 and something starts feeling weird, it's kind of like, oh man, do I call it? Do I not? I know, I'm out in the so middle of nowhere. Moment, right? right. And so it's just, I was always injured. I was always, something was always popping up, not to mention like if you are not aware that you have some inhibitions or some dysfunction in your movement patterns, right. you are just driving. You're like, just here, let me make sure that pattern just stays exactly yes. like this. Let me make sure my hamstrings are dominant. Let me make sure that, you know, this IT band issue that I'm not dealing with is pulling on my knee and like, you know, let me make sure that my ankles never get so no offense. I mean, run if you want, run if distance, run if you want. I'm just saying like, that's the main reason I can't, I, I've tried, I've dabbled and I'm like, dude, I just can't, it doesn't feel right. Like intuitively my body, my body's like, don't do that to me at this yeah. point, 41. So I Long, longevity wise, it's not sustainable. And again, I yeah. know that people find it meditative and I understand that. Yeah. I yeah. understand doing it because of, yeah. I'm just saying, Hey, right. try, try sprinting. Yeah. And see how you feel. Yeah, yeah. I think you're still gonna get that same high for less time, less amount of wear and tear on your body, and better longevity. Um, mm -hmm. because you know, I see these master sprinters all the way up to age a hundred. They're hundred they're in the one hundred to one hundred and four age sprinting, and they are not walking, they are sprinting. Yes, Julia Hawkins. Oh my awesome. gosh. Look up. Look up Julia Hurricane Hawkins. It's so much fun. She's hilarious, by the way. When I first started uh, when I was 40, so gosh, it's been, you know, eight, eight and a half years now. I remember being at a, well, I think I was 41 at this meet, but I, yeah, I was at a track meet with her and she was uh, getting ready to sprint and it was in Louisiana, a thunderstorm rolled in and they delayed it. And she was like, just like, when are they going to start this race? I am ready to race. <laughs> I'm missing my nap for this. So it start <laughs> soon. Like she was such a little firecracker. That's awesome. <laughs> so, yeah, she's great. Um, but yeah, they're still sprinting, but I'm I'm not really seeing the same age group for the long distance running. I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying it's just it's not as sustainable and, and you're not gonna have the same effects on the of aging as you are with the sprinting. Yeah. Um, for instance, the telomere length. Um, if your listeners don't know, telomeres are the caps on the ends of your chromosomes. And every time you a cell uh, turns over and breaks down and you replicate and you, you know, create a new cell, like for instance, our bones regenerate every 10 years. So we get a new set of bones um, that we grow, you know, we regenerate parts of our body, our skin, right? Um, so those tel the telomere length can be measured and that is a biomarker of longevity. So certain things lengthen telomeres and certain things shorten telomeres. So smoking, for instance, shortens telomeres. We know that that's terrible for aging. Sugar intake severely shortens telomeres, especially like sodas and candy and things like that, but definitely high sugar intake. Mm -hmm. um, things like red meat lengthen tel telomeres. Sprinting, they found longer telomeres than endurance training. So 
again, just a longevity standpoint, it's, you know, I don't like to dis to discourage any type of exercise, right? However, it's my job to give you the information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and to give yeah. you the information that I think is going to help you thrive longer. So that's yeah. my point of view. Yeah. Uh, so I'm right there with you. Um, okay. So number six is heart health, uh, heart health. Sometimes people think, okay, I'm, I run marathons or, uh, yeah, or I know someone that, you know, is fit and runs marathons and long distance. And, um, so therefore they'll never have a heart attack. Well, of course we know that's not true. Um, and in fact, what happens with endurance trained athletes is they get something that it's called like athlete's heart or it's a hypertrophy of the heart. So the, they actually get so much growth on their heart from this long cardio that it causes scar tissue and it's called in the uh, medical journals, heart remodeling and heart remodeling is not good. It actually will increase your risk of a heart attack. So mm -hmm. with the short distance bursts, sh sprint, recover, sprint, recover, high intensity, recover, high intensity, recover. They don't find this heart remodeling the same. So mm -hmm. you can exercise too much, unfortunately. Um, so heart health is another one. Interesting. Um, okay. Yeah, it is really interesting. I have, and I have all the papers to back this up. I don't, mm -hmm. I tend not to like some, when someone says, oh, what's the study or whatever, I tend not to answer because I mean, I've, I've read for hours and hours and it's like a hundred studies, you know, and I don't feel yeah, like it's my right. responsibility, but, but sometimes I will include the, you know, the public or the, yeah, the PubMed um, ID number or something like that. Yeah. So if anyone's curious, I'm happy to share. Yeah. Um, okay. So number seven, body fat loss. Oh, I feel like these days body fat is such a controversial subject and it shouldn't be <laughs> because yeah. I think we both know um, that there is an optimal range of body fat for both men and women. Um, now, Charles taught us it was six to 10% for men and 12 to 15% for women. You'll find other people will say, oh no, it has to be 20% for women, this and that. But no, I'm going to tell you that through my client experience, as well as the research, all of the optimal healthy biomarkers are between 12 and 15%. So if you do have a little bit of body fat to lose, sprinting is the way to do it. It's yeah. time efficient and it has, it produces more catecholamines, which means it burns fat after you stop. So yeah. when you're doing long, slow distance, you're burning some fat while you're doing it, but maybe right. you're running for an hour and something like this. And, uh, you know, you're burning a little bit of fat during that hour but with sprinting, it lasts for three hours plus afterwards, um, mm -hmm. right? We call that EPOC. Have you yeah. talked about, e about EPOC with your listeners yet? I don't know if we have on the show. Yeah. So it's basically the effect that happens after you get done. Your, 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 your body has to repair its muscles and tissues. And so it needs energy for that. And it uses mm -hmm. mostly fat for fuel to do that. It's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so the, the epoch burn is much higher with the sprinting and you could do as little as 10, eight second sprints on the grass to get that effect. Um, mm -hmm. and again, after this list, I'll, I'll give a couple of tips on how to start, but, um, so after that, number eight is you get to hold on to muscle. If you do a long distance running or, you know, biking, whatever, maybe swimming, um, you're going to get, have to get that fuel from somewhere. And oftentimes it becomes catabolic to your muscles. So that means it eats away the fuel from your muscles and then your muscles shrink. I mean, we can just look at sprinters compared to right. long distance runners and see this with our own eyes, you know, without right. any kind of tests or research. Right. So um, we know that after age 40, one of the most dangerous things is to lose too much muscle mass. And so combined, you know, of course, resistance training is always good, but the sprinting will allow you to get a cardiovascular um, uh, health benefit without having too much cardiac remodeling. And also, so you get this part, you can strengthen your heart and you hold on to your muscle mass um, because you really want that muscle mass for all those things like hormone balance and you know, all those things that, you know, bone health. I don't, I, that's not even on my list, but it should be right. I have a whole article right. on my website about it. Sprinting is mm -hmm. great for bone health because, uh, as you age, your bones are getting weaker and you want them to be more dense and the sprinting, the impact of the sprinting actually makes your bones stronger. And again, I just, like I just said, we gen regenerate bones every 10 years. Mm -hmm. So it's not too late. It's never too late to start. I actually just got my dad sprinting. He's 81. 
he's so awesome. Yeah. And I, Ooh, fingers crossed. I almost got him like ready to sign up for world championships. He's like, I don't know if I'm not, you know, I'm like, you don't have to be good. You can jog one lap around or one, you know, one yeah. years. you don't even have to be good. You just have to just try it for the experience. So, uh, yeah. so much fun. It's so right. much fun. And the people oh. are so supportive of each other. Like what a community, you know? Um, it felt like during COVID and, you know, even now, like with politics, everybody seems so divided. Yeah. You go to a master's track meet and, oh my gosh, just, it doesn't matter what age, race, color, what, you know, what country you're from. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Everyone's cheering each other on. It's just the most special experience. I, I really can't recommend it enough. So, oh. um, okay. So hold on to muscles, number eight. So number nine, reactive oxygen species, ROS. So this is the oxidative stress that happens when you exercise or when you have uh, environmental contaminants, uh, synthetic fragrance, um, toxins from the environment, microplastics. Your body's always fighting these um, this oxidative stress. But when you're doing endurance training, the oxidative stress goes through the roof. Now, this particular, particular research is most abundant in ultra marathon running. But it does happen. Uh, there is some research in marathon running as well. Um, but the reactive oxygen species, you've got these little electrons that are free and loose and they're bouncing around, damaging your cells. Um, that really increases aging fast. And so you want right, to have antioxidants. But what they found in the research is there's no amount of antioxidants that you can intake that will fix the ROS from endurance work particularly wow. again, ultra in this research, uh -huh. but sometimes there's a little bit more fun. Mm -hmm. Sprinting doesn't have that. Why? Because you're bursting and resting, bursting yeah. and resting. And then really because you've only run for, you know, probably intervals for maybe 45 minutes to an hour uh, that are short, you have recovery time. You're having recovery time within that hour. So the recovery time allows your body to repair quicker. Um, so it's less ROS. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Number 10, uh, better AQP4 response. What is that? Okay. This is my favorite one. And you're going to love this one. AQP4 is uh, called aqua pro, pro, aqua pro, but I can't even say it. Protein four, pro, protein four. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that is the water channel that helps you get rid of the junk in your brain. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's actually a protein that transports water in your brain. Up until 2012, we thought we only had a lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is what drains all of your metabolites out of your body. But we didn't know that we had a glymphatic system with a G. And that's particularly only in your brain. This happens at night when we sleep. And what happens is our glial cells, G-L-I-A-L, will shrink. And our cerebros cerebrospinal fluid will flow through and clean out all of the junk in the brain. This includes, uh, you know, the amyloid beta proteins that they associate with Alzheimer's. So tau tangles, amyloid, these are all associated with Alzheimer's. So you really, that what they're finding is that clearance is impaired. The AQP4 clearance is impaired. Um, and so those are building up in the brain. So sprinting, particularly high intensity exercise, they've recently found is Ooh. clearing the brain better than if you're not doing it. Well, if you're doing any exercise, it's better than nothing. So yeah, right. you know, even if you're marathon training, it's better than not doing anything. Exercise mm -hmm. does help it. However, the higher the intensity, the more clearance you're getting at night. Um, and this is really, really important. Um, there, oh gosh, there's been all kinds of uh, discoveries recently in the past couple of years in Alzheimer's with the uh, relim, um, genetics and things like this, but basically what it comes down to is that, you know, they think the tau tangles and the amyloid beta protein is, um, a res you know, some sort of inflammation response, but that these other things like relin are neuroprotective. So they can, even if you have a lot of those, if you have like a genetic, like they found this guy that had some gene turned on to have more relin than anybody else. And that protected them against the Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, even though he had a lot of tangles as well. But what they find is that if the AQP4 transport is impaired, this is the most detrimental thing. Um, so anything we can do to help that is going to be good. And that, yeah. again, research is that more intense 
exercise. Mm -hmm. yep. So that's my top 10. I know I kind of went through fast, but that was awesome. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. So now since everyone's like, okay, sign me up. <laughs> right guys. Right guys. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> where would you recommend? Okay. Let's, so let's say somebody's just listening to this in their car or whatever right now. And they're like, okay, that sounds really good. But my options are like sprint outside, or maybe I could do it at the turf of my gym, but that'd be way too embarrassing. Maybe I will, maybe I won't, you know, where do yeah. you recommend somebody starts? And maybe they also just on the social side of things, right? Cause some people are like, I'm just going to show up at this like track thing. Like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. so from personal if, if you, to you, social. Yeah. If you're in Chicago or something like that, we'll say, and you look up your Chicago Association for Masters or, your, you know, the clubs, track clubs in your area, I guarantee if you call that person, you say, I've never sprinted before, but I'm interested in sprinting, you know, to, for health benefits, for longevity, they're going to welcome you with open arms. Like I really feel confident in that because, um, again, the master's track community is like, they're just very welcoming and they are encouraging of everyone else. And they love to help beginners because they're like, Oh, somebody I can teach and share my knowledge with. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah. So I think, you know, tr you try to be brave. If you do approach a, an association or when I say association, I mean like each um, state has their own association and you can find the track clubs listed in your area um, by at usatf.org. Um, but how do we start? Like, okay, so take me for instance, like say if I was beginning, I live in a place now on the big Island where there's no track. Like yeah. if I can find a track that's open, it's going to be an hour and a half drive. So I have to train on the field, which is fine. Actually field sprinting is where I like people to start two things. One, I tell people to start. If you've never ever sprinted before, start strength training, do a month of strength training first, um, particular to running so you want to do um like knees over toes style split squats which was not invented by atg don't even get me started on that <laughs> but was a you know charles's work um discovering that but so you want to do like this the knees over toes style split squats regular uh, back squats um you know obviously hire a coach such as yourself that has a knowledge of how to staff things in abc uh, series um, but front squats are another good one. Um, Pullican step ups are excellent um, for VMO activation. That's your quad that protects your knees. Um, calf raises and all of these things that are going to tibialis raises for sure mm -hmm. that are going to strengthen your legs. And then shoulder work for your upper body, biceps, triceps, um, chest, pec. These are all important for sprinting. So. I'm just giving some examples in case people are like, I have no idea what are exercises for running, but these are examples. So you want to strength train for a month at least. And then you want to start walking up a hill. Why walking up a hill? Because it forces your foot into dorsiflexion, which means your toe is up. When you're sprinting, you want to hit the ball of your foot on the ground beneath your hip. So it's kind of a, a clawing act action. Um, and in order to do that, your toe needs to be up. So uh, hill walking actually promotes the correct form. So remember you were saying like when you repetitively run in long distances with, you know, maybe a tilted pelvis or something like that, you just reinforce all of that. Same thing with the sprinting, you want to reinforce the correct movements. So yeah. you can do this also through drills. I have a, a free dynamic warm up for sprinting on my YouTube. Just starting with that would be an excellent way because there are some buildups and different track drills and things like that. And let me tell you, if you show up to your local track club and you know that dynamic warm-ups for sprinting by the you know back of your hand, they're going to be like, oh, you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> it's on my YouTube. My YouTube is um, Ma'am Metabolic Analytics Maui. Um, but uh, yeah, so walking up a hill and then gradually increasing the pace. So that would be something three times a week for sure to do any of these. And then you can move to the grass and you can do your 10 eight-second sprints. Take plenty of time in between because the higher the intensity you do, the more rest that you want. So you can do all kinds of different workouts and just play with the rest period. But you know, you wanna take at least three minutes in between um, sprints, eight second sprints. You can even take five minutes if you want to. And you're not going 100%, you're going like 80 to 90%. As long as you're going eight, above 85%, I consider it a sprint because mm -hmm. that's the uh, threshold for intensity that creates mm -hmm. the benefits. Um, so don't go all out your first time we don't yeah. want you to pull anything 
right. and definitely strength train, train first because that will prevent the injury. Um, so yeah, walking up the hill, then increase to jogging. Second, go to the grass and, and make sure it's not you know uneven and start with um, 10 times eight second sprints. And then you could increase to, you know, uh, basically a little bit longer and uh, maybe less reps. So if you do, there's a workout I love to do that's a little bit more of a conditioning type sprint workout, but it's fun to play with. It's called hundreds on the minute. And you measure out with a, you can get a measuring wheel and a little stopwatch. You can measure out a hundred meters on the grass or less if you don't want to go that far. And then, what? but 100 meters works really well for the timing. And then you start your watch when you run and say you run it in 20 seconds, then you have 40 seconds rest on the other side. But if you're new and you're not running it in 20 seconds and you run it in 40 seconds, then you only have 20 seconds rest on the other side. So mm -hmm. it helps you get in shape to run faster. Right. You can do this all the way to, you know, 95% sprint and you'll be dead, right? Because it'll mm -hmm. be a really good hard workout. That's cool. But I try to keep it somewhere in this one in the somewhere in the um, 90% range of effort. Okay. Yeah. Cool. On, on the like and you do 10 of them. Mm, that sounds yeah. fun. Yeah. Okay. And then on your website, you also, you, you said you have like sprint training programs, right? That they can follow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So if you're on a budget, then just get the book fast over 40, because there's a couple okay. beginning workouts in there. If you're not like ready to train, um, mm -hmm. but if you're like, okay, I I've already sprinted. I know how to sprint like yourself and I want to train for the world championships and be, you know, I want to just see what I can do. Um, mm -hmm. something more structured and more, um, I would say pinpointed to anywhere from the 60 to the 200 to the 400, which are the three sprints offered there. Uh, indoor. Um, this is my sprint programs. I have three months at a time and it's um, 250 for three months. So um, you just buy the three months at a time and then it gives you every single, it gives you three workouts a week for three months and then you move on to the next set and then the next set. So, okay, cool. Yeah. And that's mam808.org. Mam808.org. Okay. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. Um, Let's see any, any last things, but just to kind of let them know, you do have like a cookbook, you have your fast over 40 book and you also have yeah. your ma'am kitchen favorites cookbook. So we'll link all that stuff up. We got your sprint coaching, obviously. Do you coach people individually? I'm assuming you're talking about all these. I, yeah, I, I really don't anymore. I just don't okay, have okay. time. Um, okay. so, yeah. And even the metabolics, I have a waiting list, um, okay. but feel free to sign up for the waiting list, list if you okay. want to. Um, but yeah, because I have like, my ha I have so many Olympians and professional athletes and I do co I do one-on-one -on -one coach, um, a local girl actually here in the state of Hawaii. She's, she ran 56 for her sophomore year last year, 10th grade. So oh, she's a hammer. Wow. She, yeah, she's, yeah. uh, goes to, uh, Pono Waena school. Nice. And so I do, I do one-on-one -on -one coach her. Um, but I generally, I just don't even really have time for it anymore. Um, so I just do the sprint programs, but I am available for feedback. So if you're like, I'm not really sure what this means or what do I do? You know, you can email me and, cool. and I will get back to you. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. And then fast over 40 on Instagram, anywhere else they should find no, you. I mean, I think I, I might have a Twitter, but I never use it. So I mostly just okay. use Instagram and I'm very up to date. Instagram. I try to post every day. Okay. It's, a, like, it's like a love hate thing. Like I just yep. really don't like <laughs> social media at all. But at the same time, like every time I'm like, I'm just going to stop posting. I'm just so just, uh, it's just annoying to even go on Instagram. Or <laughs> I mean, you know, I got on totally. Facebook in 2020 and I've never looked back. I'm like, it's the best decision I've ever had done. But uh -huh. and I, I feel that way about Instagram, but gosh, I get messages all the time about mm -hmm. like, thank you so much. You've helped me so much. Mm -hmm. Or like, look at Allison, you know, like she right. called me on Instagram. Right. And, she, and she watched all of my things and learned right. all of my tips for metabolics yeah. to get to where she was. And so I'm like, oh, I have no idea how many other people are out there with that, be, besides the ones that are messaging me all the time saying, right. thank you so much. You changed my life. That's not, I mean, you know how it is. It's like, yep. right? make a difference. It's like I don't have to, but I choose to. And then sometimes I don't freaking choose to for maybe yeah. a week or so. And that's just how it is. And it's okay. <laughs> and that's okay. Yeah. But, all right well Cynthia okay. so many props thank you for being so inspiring it's just like oh, yeah. doing the discus and all this I mean, hurdles like you've never oh, done well, any of that. 
pole <laughs> balls. Yeah. It's so, so awesome. And I think inspires and all of us like, whoa, am I doing anything new like that? So it's, it's nice. It really, it awakens the spirit of like, hmm, maybe yeah, I should, should learn always, some I new stuff. Everyone should always be starting to learn. And it doesn't have to be, you know, athletic, although, um, you know, the more, the more dopamine that's released, like the more risk reward, the, the better your neuroplasticity will be. But for instance, I also learned a couple of years ago how to shoot a, a bow and I wanted to shoot. Awesome. And sh I, well, I told my husband like, oh, I'm over coffee one morning. Like, I, I think I want to shoot an elk with a bow. And he was like, have you ever shot a bow before? And I'm like, no. And he's like, okay, well, let's start with some Maliaxis deer. <laughs> so patient with me. Wow. So you did it? Yeah. Yes, I actually, I missed my first deer, but I did get a deer. That's another story, how I got my deer. Actually, I can tell you if you want, because it's kind of fun, but um, I, but I still shoot my bow and I love shooting my bow. So cool. um, yeah, it's back on Maui when I went to Lahaina um, for my most recent visit. I just got back yesterday. I got to shoot. Oh, you did? Yeah, I haven't brought it over yet, but, um, oh. but it, there's plenty of pigs to shoot over here. Um, yes. Yeah. My my first deer I got, I actually um, was walking my dog and there was like a hill and she scented the deer, the herd of deer. And she, she started running down the path and I guess they smelled her and they came running up over the hill and at me, which normally deer run away from me, right? So right. they started coming running at me because I guess they're, where they jumped over the fence was behind me. And my, one of them was running at me and the dog, my dog leapt like a police dog and intercepted the deer oh, before wow. it got to me and took it down by the neck. <laughs> so I didn't actually shoot my first axis deer. <laughs> oh my gosh. So your dog was like, I wanted to do that too. <laughs> you and your dog are hunters. Now yeah. all of a sudden. <laughs> I, like, I think she, one, she likes you know she liked the smell of the deer because yeah, yeah, yeah. Like we, we would hunt the deer and my husband hunt the deer and give her the deer leg for a bone. oh wow okay like, i think she she was ready it. but also yeah. i think she was protecting me honestly yeah for sure and she, she just left it she pinned it there and she was just like look mom i did my job and the deer was still alive obviously and scared because it um it was just scared of her. So it didn't, didn't even try to escape. She just kept it like right there. And if it would try to move, she would just oh, wow. kind of like pin it with her mouth, but not angrily. She was just all, Oh, I did my job. <laughs> wow. So, yeah, I got a then, local family here that I, their family lives on Maui and I buy the deer from them. They sell oh, okay. it around here. So if you ever oh, the deer's good, yeah. want some, I can tell you where to find it. <laughs> yeah. So a little off on a tangent, but that's how I got yeah. my first deer. Not with with my <laughs> with the dog yeah. well wow so good thing, like, it's always fun to learn new things you know shooting the yeah. boat is something totally like right. I've never done before um and it's just yeah it's like try to find something that's interesting to you and you know that's how you feel empowered like you just learn all these different things and, and that just totally. helps you have confidence to go through your day and um then maybe you become good enough to help others and yeah. in your accounts um, yeah so, that's part of what, it, what I wrote in my book is that it's really good to give back. Like part of your foundation to being your superhero optimal self is giving back to your community. So I know all of us have a talent, you know, whatever it may be, you have something that you do that's better than someone else. And I think that you can share that talent and by giving it for free to your community or, you know, your church or what, whatever your community looks like. Mm -hmm. um, you actually create a relationship that gives you a solid foundation to be who you are. I don't know if that yep. makes sense. It's a little hundred percent. Okay. hundred um, percent. Yeah. yeah. So that, that helps you become your superhero optimal self because then you have this community foundation where you're not asking for anything in return. You're just giving your talents and then they in turn support you and who you are. Yep. Okay. Yeah. hundred percent. Thank you so much, Cynthia. We'll wrap it up Pleasure. there. It's perfect. <laughs>